Mr. Diddy. Yo, this is Quasi Low in the Cap City, and you are listening to Giamme Journey. This is Brother Asaru, and you now listen to the Giamme Journey Radio. Peace. This is Cleveland, and you're listening to Giamme Journey Radio. You are now listening to Giami Journey Radio. Say this is Asha. And you are now listening to Giami Journey Radio. Peace. Peace. Great day, great day, great day. This is Brother Hatim coming at you live. On and, and hit the ancestor uh, MLK, Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm about to go on and broadcast one of his speeches. So you know these speeches be long. So y'all got to bear with me. And I pre-record them. I want to apologize to those that was maybe trying to tune in to the live show. But the signal out here is horrible. So um, I have to kind of pre-record, then try to upload because I got like shows. I'm, I'm backlogged right now. As far as the shows, some of the um, things that's going on, it's something that I want people to know about. But I want you to understand how important it is for uh, how important it is for you to support something like this. You know what I'm saying? In order to keep something going like this in, in our communities and all the communities that it's affecting, we have to be able to fund it. We need to be able to fund it, and and the ultimate goal is to be able to get our own campsite so that.
and it's a very powerful piece. And um, we need to make sure we have these things, th this type of thing going on nationwide. You know, so that that's what I'm talking about getting the getting the camp plan, uh, the the um, the. every african-american youth and we'd be able to rent it out to other people but i'm talking about specifically as far as the mission of simba and simpson for african-american youth we can have one of these located in areas throughout the country where everybody's within three hours of the campsites you know what i'm saying so we just have to be strategic about how we place it that means we have to do some forethought that means we have to really put we really have to put some eagles to the side and, and not Born in, in the government side, but he wasn't a major, major issue until he started speaking on the Vietnam War, where he started combining on, on for our civil rights and worker rights, and then he started dealing with the war. So now, because, you know, a lot of people don't really look at it like this, but this is Brother High Tim's perspective, right? As long as he was dealing with the civil rights, right? He was doing nothing but putting money in the powers to be's pockets, right? Because think about it. The restaurants, the buses, all this stuff, they, they did nothing but benefit. They would do nothing but benefit from receiving the new influx of customers called, that were black people. You know what I'm saying? We were fighting for those rights. And I don't understand that, but that's what we were. You know what I'm saying? We wanted equal access and, and, and you know, but hey, that's a whole nother piece. But the piece is, those fights, that fight, the civil rights fight, was putting money into the pockets of people, right? You know, you had to deal with your personal feelings about being close to somebody, but once you get to know people, all that phase away, we know that. Martin Luther King became an issue when he started speaking truth to power and started talking about the war. He started talking about workers' rights. Now he's taking money out of people's pockets, so he becomes a threat. So let's get into um, this speech. Um, this one, I have to give shots out to the site because I forgot to give shots out to the site from yesterday, so I'm about to look those up. Um, the name of this site is called American Rhetoric Online Speech Bank. Um, actually, they got a download. I could download something on here. Okay. All right. And this speech was delivered um, April 4th, 1967 at the Riverside, Riverside Church, New York City. Um, they say it's authentic, authentic, authenticity, authenticity certified. Text version below transcribed directly from the audio. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I need not pause to say how very delighted I am to be here tonight and how very delighted I am to see you expressing your concern about the issues that will be discussed tonight by turning out in such large numbers. I also want to say that I am consider it a great honor to share this program with Dr. Bennett, Dr. Kamanger, and Rabbi Heschel, and some of the distinguished leaders and personalities of our nation and of course it's always good to come back to Riverside Church over the last eight years I have had the privilege of preaching here almost every year in that period and it is always a rich and rewarding experience to come to this great church 
and this great pulpit. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I join you in this meeting because I am in deepest agreement with the aims and work of the organization which has brought us together. Clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. The recent statements of your executive committee are the sentiments of my own heart and I find myself in full accord when I read its opening lines. A time comes when silence is betrayal. A time comes when silence is betrayal. And that time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. The truth of these words is beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us is, most, is a most difficult one. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in times of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one. importance to try to state clearly and I trust concisely why I believe that the path from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church the church in Montgomery Alabama where I began my pastorate leads clearly to this sanctuary tonight I come to this platform tonight to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation this speech is not addressed to Hanoi or the National Liberation Front it is not addressed to China or to Russia, nor is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the total situation and the need for a collective solution to the Tonight, however,
there were there were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the build up in Vietnam. And I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if there were, as if were some idle political plaything of a political going mad on war. On a society going mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in a rehabilitation of its poor so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor to attack it and to attack it as such. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die in extraordinary high proportions relative to the rest of the population. You were taking a black young man who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. And so we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negroes and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to see them together in the same schools. And so we watch them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village, but we realize that they would hardly live in the same block in Chicago. I could not be silent in the face of such a cruel manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves me to an even deeper level of awareness, for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of North and over the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social, that social change comes meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems to bring about the changes it wanted. Their question hit home, and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our voice, under our violence, I cannot be silent. For those who ask the question, aren't you a civil rights leader and thereby mean to exclude me from the movement for peace? I have this further answer. In 1957, when a group of us formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we chose as our motto to save the soul of America. We were convinced that we could not limit our vision to certain rights for black people, but instead affirmed the conviction that America would never be free or saved from itself until the descendants of its slaves were loosed completely from the shackles they still wear. In a way, we were agreeing with Langston Hughes that the black bard, that black bard of Harlem who had written earlier, oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Now, it should be incandescently clear that no one who has any concern for the integrity and the life of America today can ignore the present war. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autops autopsy must read Vietnam. It can never be saved so long as it destroys the deepest hopes of the men of the world over. So it is that those of us who are yet determined that America will be are are led down the path of protest and dissent, working for the path, working for the health of our land. As if the weight of such a commitment to life and the health of America were not enough, another burden of responsibility was placed upon me in 1954. And I cannot forget the Nobel Peace Prize was also a commission, a commission to work harder than I have 
ever worked before for the brotherhood of man. This is a calling that takes me beyond national allegiance. But even if it were not present, I would have to live with the meaning of my commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. To me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious that I sometimes marvel at those who ask me, why am I speaking against the war? Could it be that they do not know that the good news was meant for all men, for communists and capitalists, for children and ours, for, for their children and ours, for black and for white, for revolutionary and conservative? Have they forgotten that my ministry is in obedience to the one who loved this, his enemy so fully that he died for them? What then can I say to the Viet Cong or to Castro or to Mao as a faithful minister of this one? Can I threaten them with death or must I not share with them my life? And finally, as I try to explain for you and for myself the road that leads from Montgomery to this place, I will have offered all that was most valid if I simply said that I must be true to my convictions that I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race of, or, or nation or creed is the vocation of sonship and brotherhood. And because I believe that the Father is deeply concerned, especially for those suffering and helpless and outcast children, I come tonight to speak for them. This I believe to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiance and loyalties which are broader and deeper than nationalism, which go beyond our nation's self-denied goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for the victims of our nation, and for those it calls enemies. For no document from human hands can make, can make these humans any less our brothers. As I ponder the madness of Vietnam and search within myself for ways to understand and respond in compassion, my mind goes constantly to the people of the peninsula. I speak now not of the soldiers of each side, not of the ideologies of the Liberation Front, not of the Junta in Saigon, but simply of the people who have been living under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades now. I think of them, too because it is clear to me that there will be no meaningful solution there until some attempt is made to know them and to hear their broken cries. They must see Americans as a strange liberators. The, Viet the, the, Viet the, Viet the, Viet the Vietnamese people proclaimed their own independence in 1954 and in 1945 rather. After a combined French and Japanese occupation and before the Communist Revolution in China. They were led by Ho Chi Minh. Even though they quoted the American Declaration of Independence in their own document of freedom, we refused to recognize them. Instead, we decided to support France in its reconquest of her former colony. Our government fe felt then that the Vietnamese people were not ready for independence, and we again fell victim to the deadly Western arrogance that has poisoned the international atmosphere for so long. With that tra tragic decision, we rejected a revolutionary government seeking self-determination and a government that has been established not by clearly indigenous forces that included some of the communists for the peasants this new government meant real for not
conditions of peace and democracy in Lair and Reform. Now, they languish under our bombs and consider us not their fellow Viet Vietnamese, the real enemy. They move sadly and apath apath apathetically as we herd them off the land of their fathers into concentration camps where minimal social needs are rarely met. They know they must move on or be destroyed by our bombs. So they go primarily women and children and their age. They watch as we poison the water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roll through their areas preparing to destroy the precious trees they wander into the hospitals with at least 20 casualties from American farmers. Is degraded by our soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers soliciting for them for their mothers what do the peasants think as we ally ourselves with the landlords and as we refuse to put any action into our many words concerning land reform when do they think as we test out our latest weapons on them just as the germans tested out new medicines and new tortures in the concentration camps of europe where are the roots of the independent Vietnam claim to be building? Is it among these voiceless ones? We have destroyed the two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. We have destroyed the land and the crops. We have co cooperated in the crushing, in the crushing of the nation's only non-communist revolutionary political force, the unified Buddhist church. We have supported the enemies of the peasants of Saigon. We have corrupted their women and children and killed their men. Now, there's little left to build on, save bitterness. Soon, the only solid physical foundation remaining will be found at our military bases and in the concrete of the concentration camps we call fortified hamlets. The peasants may well wonder if we plan to build our new Vietnam on such grounds as these. Could we blame them for such thoughts? We must speak for them and raise a question they cannot raise. These two are our brothers. Perhaps a more difficult but no less necessary task is to speak for those who have been des designated as our enemies. What, what of the National Liberation Front? The strategy that, um, that strangely anonymous group we call VC or communists. What must they think of the United States of America? When they realize that we permitted the repression and cruelty of them, which helped to bring them into being a resistance group in the South, what do they think of, of our condoning the violence which led to their own um, led to their own taking up of arms? How can they believe in our integrity when we speak of aggression from the North? As if there were nothing more essential to war. How can they trust us when we now, when, when, when now we charge them with violence after the murderous reign of them and <clears throat> charge them with violence while we pour every new weapon of death into their land? Surely we must understand their feelings even if we do not condone their actions. Surely we must see that the men we supported pressed them to their violence. Surely we must see that our own computerized plans of destruction simply dwarf their greatest acts. How do they judge us when our officials know that their membership is less than 25% communist? and yet insist on giving them the blanket name. What must they be thinking when they know that we are aware of their control of major sections of Vietnam, and yet we appear ready to allow national elections? Highly organized political parallel government will have
surely right to wonder what kind of new government we plan to help form without them. The only party in real touch with the peasants. To question our political goals and they deny the reality of, of a peace settlement from which they will be excluded. Their questions are frightening, relevant, frighteningly relevant. Is our nation planning to build on political myth again and then shore it up upon the power of new violence? Here's the true meaning and value of compassion and not violence. When it helps us to see the enemy point of view, to hear this question, to know this assessment of ourselves, for, for from his view, we may indeed see the basic weakness of our condition. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers who are called the opposition. So, two with that north, in the north, where our bombs now pummel the land and our minds endanger the waterways. We are met by a deep but understandable mistrust. To speak for them is to explain the lack of of confidence in Western words, and especially their distrust of American intentions now. In Hanoi, are the men who led the nation to independence against the Japanese and French, the men who sought membership in the French Commonwealth and were betrayed by the weakness of Paris and the willingness of the colonial armies, it was they who led a second struggle against the French. Domination at tremendous cost and then were persuaded to give up the land they controlled between the 13th and 17th parallel as a temporary measure at Geneva. After 1954, they watched us conspire with them to prevent elections which could have surely brought Ho Chi Minh to power over, uh, over United Vietnam, and they realized that they had been betrayed again. When we asked why they do not leap to negotiate these things must be rem remembered. Also, I must be clear that the leaders of the Hanoi consider the presence of American troops in support of them regime to have been an initial military breach of the Geneva Agreement concerning foreign troops. They remind us that they did not begin to send troops in large numbers and even supplies to the South until American forces had moved into the ten, moved in into the tens of thousands. Hanoi remembers how our leaders refused to tell us the truth about the, the earlier North Viet, Viet, Vietnamese overtures for peace. How the president claimed that none, that none existed when they had clearly been made. Ho Chi Minh has watched as American, as, as America has spoke, spoken of peace and built up its forces. And now he has surely heard the increasing international rumors of Americans' plans for invasion of the North. He knew, he knows the bombing and shelling and the mining we are going, that we are doing are part of the traditional pre-invasion strategy. Perhaps only his sense of rumors and of irony have him when he hears the most powerful nation in the world speaking of aggression as it does. Thousands of bombs on a poor, weak nation, more than 800, rather, 8,000 miles away from its shores. At this point, I should make it clear that while I have tried in these last few minutes to give a voice to the voices of Vietnam and to understand the arguments of those who are called enemy, I am as deeply concerned about our own troops there as anything else. For it occurs to me that what we are submitting them to in Vietnam is not simply the brutalizing process that goes on in any war where armies face each other and seek to destroy. We are adding cynicism to the process of death, for they must know after a short period that their
that there period there that none of the things we claim to be fighting for are really involved. Before long, they must know that their government has sent them into a struggle among Vietnamese and more sophisticated surely realize that we are on the side of the wealthy and the secure while we create a hell for the poor. So how this madness must cease. We must stop now. I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering poor of Vietnam. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted. I speak of them for the poor of America who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at, at home and death and corruption in Vietnam. I speak as, as, as a, a citizen of the world for the world as it stands against a gas at the path we have taken. I speak as one who loves America to the leaders of our own nation. The great initiative in this war is ours. The initiative to stop, it must be ours. This is the message of the great Buddhist leader of Vietnam. Recently, one of them wrote these words, and I quote, each day, the war goes on, and the hatred increases in the hearts of the Vietnamese, and in the hearts of those of humanitarian instinct. The Americans are forcing even their friends into becoming their enemies. It is curious that Americans who calculate so clearly on the possibilities of military victory um, forgot that in the process they are very in the mind of the world that we have no honorable intentions in Vietnam. If we do not stop our war against the people of Vietnam immediately, the world will be left with no other alternative than to see this is some horrible, clumsy, and deadly game we have, have decided to play. The world, is now, the world now demands a maturity of America that we may not be able to achieve. It demands that we admit that we have been wrong from the beginning of our venture in Vietnam, that we must we must we we have been detrimental to the life of the Vietnam Vietnamese people. The situation is one in which we must be ready to turn sharply from our present way in order to atone for our sins and errors in Vietnam Vietnam. We should take the initiative in bringing um a hope to the tragic tragic war. Long pause. I would like to suggest five concrete things that our government should do immediately to begin a long and difficult process of, as, of extricating ourselves from the nightmarish conflict. Number one, in all bombing in North and South Vietnam. Number two, declare a unilateral ceasefire in the hope that such actions will create the atmosphere for negotiation. Three, take immediate steps to prevent other battlegrounds in Southeast Asia by curtailing our military buildup in Thailand and our interference in Laos. In Laos. Four, realistically accept the fact that the National Liberation Front has substantial support in South Vietnam and must thereby play a role in any meaningful negotiation and any uh, future Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam government. Five, Set a date that will remove of the all foreign troops from Vietnam in accordance with the 1954 Geneva Agreement.
part of our part of our ongoing part of our ongoing commitment might well express itself in an offer to grant asylum to any Vietnamese who fears for his life under a new regime which include which included the Liberation Front. Then we must make what happens then we must ask Part of ongoing commitment might well express itself in an offer to grant asylum to the Vietnamese who fear for his life under a new regime which includes the Liberation Front. Then we must make that reparations we can for the damage we have done. We must provide the medical aid that is badly needed, making it available in this As we counsel young men concerning military service, we must clarify for them our nation's role in Vietnam and challenge them with the alternative of conscientious objection. I am pleased to say that this is a path now college. This, I am pleased to say that this is a path now chosen by more than 70 students in my own alma mater, Morehouse College. And I recommend it to all who find um, who find the American course in uh, Vietnam a dishonorable and unjust one. Moreover, I would encourage all ministers of draft age to give what. Now there's, a, oh God. All right. Moreover, I would encourage all ministers of draft age to give up their ministerial exemptions and seek status as conscious and objectors. These are the times for real choices and not false ones. We are at the moment when our lives must be placed on the line if, we, if our nation is to survive its own folly. Every man of humane conviction must decide on the protest that best suits his convention, but we must all protest. Now, there's something seductively tempting about stopping there and sending us all off on what, what in some circles has become a popular crusade against the war in Vietnam. I said we must enter this struggle, but I wish to go on now to say something even more disturbing. The war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a far deeper malady within American spirit and if we ignore this sobering reality and if we ignore the concern and if we ignore the sobering reality we will find ourselves organizing clergy and laymen concerned committees for the next generation. They will be concerned about Guatemala, Guatemala and Peru they will be concerned about Thailand and Cambodia. They will be concerned about Mozambique and South America. We will be marching for these and a dozen other names and attending rallies without end unless there is a significant and profound change in American life and policy. Whoa. And so, such thoughts take us beyond Vietnam, but not beyond our calling as sons of the living God. In 1957, a sensitive American official overseas said that it seemed to him
revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable, increasingly by choice or by accident. This is the role our nation has taken, the role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privilege and the pleasures that came Prophets are my fault. All right, I'm going to have to stop right here. I'm going to come back. I'm going to have to finish this a little bit later. Because this is long. Well, I'm almost done. I'm going to push through. Uh, all right, so let's take a break. Listen, let's take a break. I need to take a break. I need to take a break. Hold on.
right, so we're going to continue where we left off. I had to stand up and stretch because I didn't think this speech was that long, but this is almost as long as uh, uh, Frederick Douglass' speech. So let me go on and take a sip of coffee. Excellent speech. And I want people that, that are listening, I want you to pay attention to the fact that with the past speeches that we done did this week in saluting our ancestors, I want you to recognize the fact that many of the things and many of the concerns that they had are still present today. All right? Uh, you need to really recognize that. You need to look at that. But hold on. Here we go. It was with such activity in mind that the words of the late John F. Kennedy come back to haunt us. Five years ago, he said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Increasingly, by choice or by accident, this is the role of our, our nation has taken. The role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas, overseas investments. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution. On the right side of the world's revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin, we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When are considered more important to people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the good Samaritans on life's roadside, but that we will be only an initial act. One day we must come to see that the word, the whole Jericho road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that the edifice which provides beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of value will soon look uneasily on a glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. With righteous indignation, it will look across the seas and see the individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say, this is not just. It will look at our alliance with the landed gentry of South America and say, this is not just. The Western arrogance of feeling that it has everything to teach others and nothing to learn from them is not just. A true revolution of values will lay hand on the world, world order and say of war. This way of settling differences is not just. The business of burning human beings with napalm or, or of, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of people normally humane, of sending men from dark and bloody battlefields physically handicapped and psychologically deranged cannot be reconciled with love. Alcitrant status quo with bruised hands until we have fashioned it into a brotherhood. The kind of positive revolution of values is our best defense against communism. War is not the answer. Communists will never be defeated by the use of atomic bombs or nuclear weapons. 
Let us not join those who shout war and through their misguided passions urge the United States to relinquish its participation in the United Nations. These are the days which demand wise restraint and calm reasonableness. We must not engage in a negative anti-communism, but rather in a positive thrust for democracy, realizing that our greatest defense against communism is to take our offensive actions in behalf of justice. We must, with positive actions, seek to remove these conditions of poverty, insecurity, and injustice, which are the fertile soil in which the seed of communism grows and develops. These are the revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of, of exploitation and oppression. And out of the wounds of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. We in the West must support these revolutions. It is a sad fact that because of comfort, complacency, and morbid fear of communism and of our proneness to adjust to injustice, the Western nations that initiate so much of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world have now become the arch anti-revolutionaries. This has driven many to feel that only Marxism has a revolutionary spirit. Therefore, communism is a judgment against our failure to make democracy real and follow through on the revolutions that we initiated. Our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into sometimes a hostile war declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo and unjust mores and thereby speed the day when, speed to the day when, Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. A genuine revolution of values means, in the final analysis, that our loyalties must become incommunicable rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty. misinterpreted concept so really dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as a weak and cowardly force has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of man. When I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I am not speaking of that force which is just emotional bosh. I am speaking of that force which all the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. The Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist beliefs about ultimate, ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and in knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let us hope that the Spirit will become the order of the day. We can no longer afford to worship the God of hate or bow before the altar of retaliation. The ocean of history are made turbulent by ever-rising tides of hate, and history is cluttered with the wreckage of nations and individuals that pursue the self-defeating path of hate. As Arnold Tony B. says, Love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our, vic in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word, unquote. We are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. 
It is this unfolding conundrum of life and history. There is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is at minute to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. Omar Khayyam is right. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. We still have a choice today. Nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. We must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to speak for peace in Vietnam and justice throughout the developing world, throughout the developing world, a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess of peace. If we will make the right choice, we'll be able to transform the jangling discord of the world, of our world, into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. If we will but make the right choice, we'll be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like the mighty stream. Woo! Alright. So, I read the whole thing, right? So, Is a fundraiser for symbols, so you always can go on and support us because where else do I have time to do something like this? You know what I'm saying? Where else do I have time to think about, even think about reading a Martin Luther King speech or a Marcus Garvey speech or a Frederick Douglass speech or and, and even think about using it? Where else can we do this? We need to go and make sure we're able to do this forever. This is Brother Tim, and I'm saying peace.
This is a Heart of a Symbol production. Where we strive to blow up your old paradigms. (laughs) 